Hello, my name is Emily Bengals, and I received my doctorate in Holocaust and Genocide Studies from Gratz a few years ago. And I'm very grateful to be able to talk to you today about a topic that is near and dear to my heart, the Little Prince. Many people describe it as being a story by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, which is an allegory linking in some ways to the Jesus Christ story, as you see at the end of the book, a picture of the little prince and a star in the east going off to his own home planet where he can help the world. But I would like to present it as a story that also has very important Jewish roots. This comes out of the context from whence the book was written. Antoine de Nixupéry wrote the book in the United States when he had escaped occupied France, and he made direct references to the Nazi regime. For example, he writes about a great danger called the Baobabs, which he takes as the most serious item. And he has a picture here of three Baobab trees growing so large that they could destroy a whole planet. This was at the time that the Axis forces were a group of three. And you see here the picture of it taking over the planet. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry was initially involved as a pilot and for the French, and he left France when he came to the United States during the war, but then when it looked like his help was more needed, he did return to fight for the French and the French resistance. He did disappear in a plane accident many years later, decades later he was found. But this book was written away from his home land in Long Island actually. His house is in the corner right here. And he definitely valued and wrote and spoke a lot about his experiences. So again, this comes out of a time period where the world was at war and one could say that he was very aware of the war but that doesn't necessarily make it having jewish roots the dedication to me is what's the final straw here the dedication of the little prince is a very clear shout out to the jewish plight during the holocaust he dedicates the book to Leon Worth, Leon Verde, who was his mentor. And when you see where it talks about his third reason for dedicating it to him, he says, he lives in France where he is hungry and cold. He needs cheering up. And then he dedicates the book to Leon Worth when he was a little boy. He writes in French, mais aussi à cause d'une dette spirituelle. She, he owes him a spiritual debt. And he continues, Et il ne sait pas combien je lui dois. And he doesn't know how much I even owe him. So his world view, in some ways, his spiritual debt, goes to this mentor of his, who is in France where he is hungry and cold. This is Léon Verde. He was a Jewish scholar, older than Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. He wrote a lot. One of the things that remains and is currently in print is 33 Days, which is the story of his escape when the French succumbed to the Nazis. He did go into hiding. He did survive. But Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, when he was in the United States, did not know this. He wrote, the one who haunts my memory tonight is 50 years old. He is ill and he is Jewish. How will he survive the German terror? 
to be able to imagine that he still breathes, I have to believe him overlooked by the invader, secretly protected by the magnificent wall of silence built around him by the farmers of his village, the resistance. Only so can I think that he is still alive. Only then, when I, far away, roam in the realm of his friendship, which has no frontiers, can I permit myself not to feel an emigrant, but a voyager, because the desert is not where one thinks it is. The Sahara is more alive than a capital city, and the liveliest town becomes empty when the poles most essential in life lose their magnetism. You have right here, Antoine and Zuberi, praying, hoping for the resistance to be helping his friend. He's hoping for his friend to actually be invisible, and the book deals a lot with invisibility. He's wondering what does he believe? Is his friend alive? Is his friend not alive? The very end of the book deals with is the sheep someone that ate the rose or did the sheep let the rose live? And that matters to him. It matters if his friend is okay. He also, though his culture was different and his religion was different from Leon Vert, he likens himself to his mentor. He says, the care devoted to a sick person, the welcome offered to an outlaw, forgiveness itself, have their value only through the grace of a smile that brightens a special occasion. We are united in a smile that is beyond languages, classes, parties. We are the faithful of the same church, he with his customs, I with mine. Across differences, there is a deep commonality, that spiritual debt. He worries about his friend. He writes, bit by bit, it comes over us that we shall never again hear the laughter of our friend, that this one garden is forever locked against us. And at that moment begins our true mourning, which though it may not be rending, is yet a little bitter, for nothing in truth can replace that companion. Old friends cannot be created out of hand. Nothing can match the treasure of common memories, of trials endured together, of quarrels and reconciliations and generous emotions. It is idle having planted an acorn in the morning to expect that afternoon to sit in the shade of the oak. So life goes on. For years we plant the seed, we feel ourselves rich, and then come other years when time does its work and our plantation is made sparse and thin. One by one our comrades slip away, deprive us of their shade. All this plant imagery becomes part of his little prince. So let's see, what does Vert himself say? Vert's first journal entry refers to the Statue des Juifs. He says, Vichy is preparing a statute regulating Jews. A Polish Jew at least felt Jewish. People in the Nalowski village neighborhood of Warsaw did not conceive of themselves as Polish, but French Jews no longer felt Jewish. Remember, there was a lot of assimilation at that point. Those who felt most Jewish in their hearts were only Jewish through the memory of a few family traditions. Leon Vert was vu viewed as Jewish, but it was not his daily life. He was more French. And yet suddenly this was changing with the rise of Nazism. However, in December 9th, 1940, he does identify himself as a Jew. He says, I'm a Jew, but am I going to reduce the world to the comforts Jews will have in Europe of tomorrow? A few months later, I'm going to Lyon to declare that according to the terms of the law, June 2nd, 1941, I am Jewish. He writes, I feel humiliated. It's the first time that society has humiliated me. I feel humiliated not because I'm Jewish, because I'm presumed to be of inferior quality because I'm Jewish. It's absurd. It may be the fault of my pride, but that's the way it is. He was not upset about being Jewish, but he was upset about how others were othering him, marginalizing him, and putting him in danger. He continues, I'm being forced to claim that I'm from a Jewish nation to which I feel no connection. That's Werth's view of his own past. Still, in Antoine and Zupri's eyes, there is that different culture, as he saw before. Continuing with Werth, but if a foreigner means to humiliate me through this nation, I am hurt. And I don't know if it's this nation or myself I must defend but simple dignity obliges me to identify myself with it. It would be just too cowardly to deliberate whether or not I feel Jewish. If you insult the name of Jew in me, then I am Jewish, totally Jewish, Jewish to the tips of my toes, Jewish to my very guts. After that, 
we will see. This becomes kind of a kind of respectability politics. There are people who view themselves as different from their own group to kind of rise. And that happened in France between groups of Jewish people who were more established in the country and less established. But then when they're all in danger here, he ends up saying, I'm not going to make myself more respectable just because I've been in France longer than some of the more recent immigrants because I am more nationally French than nationally Jewish. He's saying, I am Jewish. I'm not putting myself above people who are newer or more visibly Jewish or more Polish style Jewish where it's their core identity. I am French. I am Jewish. I am Léon Verde. And let's see what happens. So he goes to the prefecture. He writes, as others go to declare their cattle and the weight of their pigs, I went to the prefecture to declare I was Jewish. I made my declaration at the prefecture. I threw out the word, word Jew as if I was about to sing the Marseillaise. Allons enfants de la patrie. He's acknowledging himself with pride but angry about having to do so. Back to Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. I also said to myself, the essential, there's that word essential, the essential thing that is part of the life one has led heretofore is to remain alive, and the customs, and the family celebrations, and the house full of memories. The essential thing is to live for the return. And I felt myself threatened in my very substance by the fragility of the faraway poles on which I depended. I ventured to understand a veritable desert and began to grasp a mystery which had intrigued me for a long time. He's thinking about the journey of his friend, what's essential, what matters, the friendship, the culture, the memories, and all these become images in Antoine Zanuck Superior's books. So let's then look at the messages of the book itself because it comes from a time period it deals with a specific person, all linked to Jewish culture, but there are also messages that are from the very core of the Jewish culture. The Little Prince, as, just, as written by Antoine Zufri, says, The fact that is that I did not know how to understand anything. I ought to have judged by deeds and not by words. He's talking about his rose. She cast her fragrance and her radiance over me. I ought never to have run away from her. I ought to have guessed all the affection that lay behind her poor little stratagems. Flowers are so inconsistent, but I was too young to know how to love her. I ought to have judged by deeds and not by words. Mitzvot, good deeds. Tikkun olam, repairing the world. The rose gives him beautiful sense and great joy, even though the words hurt him. He wants to do good deeds to help his rose as well. It's a story right there of making the world better, trying to. Another part of the book is when he goes to the roses and he speaks about the one that's different being the one that matters most to him. A quote from Leon Vert is, if I differ from you, far from undermining you. I enhance you. Our differences make us stronger. You go to the Talmud. Therefore, people were created unique in order to proclaim the greatness of the Holy One. For if a person strikes many coins from one mold, they are all exactly alike. Same as all the roses that were the same. But though the King of Kings, the Holy One, has fashioned every person in the stamp of the first human, not a single one of them is exactly like another. His rose is unique. Our friendships are unique. Along the same lines, the book has a theme of appearances. They say in the book again and again, what is essential is invisible to the eye. And they use this very specific example of a Turkish astronomer who saw the imaginary asteroid V612, and nobody really cared when he was in uniform of his tradition. But when he dressed more Western style, they took him seriously. This was from a time period where Jewish people 
were based on their physiognomy, declared Jewish, measured. There were signs saying what look, what somebody who is Aryan looks like and what somebody who is not Aryan looks like. And that itself can condemn someone to death or, or torture. Antoine wrote, if the Nazi exclusively respects those who resemble him, he does not respect anyone but himself. He rejects creative contradictions, destroys all hope for growth, and builds for a thousand years to come the robot of an anthill in place of the human being. Order for the sake of order alone curtails man's essential capacity to transform the world as well as himself. Life creates order, but order does not create life. He's saying, basically, we don't all need to look alike, and being all the same, being all in order, dehumanizes us. There's also the messages of taking care of your planet, and they call it la toilette de la planète. When one finishes their daily routine, you need to carefully take care of your, your planet. So each day, this is how he lives his life. We, too, need to take care of our Earth. It's not just any other planet, he says. This is our Garden of Eden. And so as we take care of the planet, as we take care of our roses, as we take care of our fox and our friends, the idea that we are all responsible for one another and that we look for peace, not just for us, not just for Israel, but for all who inhabit the earth, we leave a message of responsibility and that comes up through the little prince. He says, people have forgotten this truth, the fox said, but you mustn't forget it. You become responsible forever for what you've tamed. You are responsible for your rose. We are responsible for the earth. We are responsible for one another. Those are messages that are very central to our faith and our culture. The takeaway, the little prince came from a time period where Jews were in great peril, and Antoine de Saint-Exupéry left France because he was opposed to the Nazi regime and the Vichy regime. He left France worried about a friend of his who was Jewish, who he dedicated the book to and wrote much about. And the book has messages that are central to Judaism and which go throughout the whole world and leave the book as one of the most translated books after the Bible. So I hope you take this opportunity to think about the book and hopefully reread it. And I hope you enjoy it even half as much as I have. I've taught it for years to students. I've read it over 500 times. I consider it my personal Bible because it. every time I read it, I gain new insights. So enjoy. Thank you so much.